how do you go from being an NBA star, playing alongside Kobe Bryant? Over the shoulder on a reverse, no luck. Jamaris Critton and Kobe, you like it? I guess so. To a notorious gangster facing life in prison for murder. You said you know who did the shooting? Uh, yeah, the basketball player, Crimson. This is the story of Javaris Crittenton. Javaris was the last person you'd expect to become a murderer. Because growing up in the projects of Atlanta during the early 2000s, he was a straight-A student, class president, and a basketball phenom. In fact, by the time Javaris graduated high school in 06, he was a McDonald's All-American, and had received the D1 scholarship to Georgia Tech. And after only a year playing college ball, Javaris earned his greatest achievement yet, being a 2007 first-round draft pick for the LA Lakers and signing a $2.6 million contract. Yeah, I was just excited, you know, to be a Laker. You can't even walk in the building, you're stormed by fans. <laughs> At just 19 years old, Javaris was an NBA star, playing next to Kobe Bryant. He was on top of the world, but one night changed everything. See, one night during his first offseason, Javaris was out partying at the Block nightclub in Hollywood when someone caught his eye from across the room. Famous Atlanta rapper, Dalla, surrounded by his crew, flashing diamond chains, beautiful women, and designer clothes. A young Javaris was mesmerized, so he decided to introduce himself, only to find out that Dalla and his crew were part of a notorious LA street gang, the Mansfield Gangster Crips. And with Javaris being a professional athlete and all, he should have just walked away right then and there. But instead, he was so enticed by the gangster lifestyle that he hung out with Dalla and his crew all night long. And over the next couple of months, Javaris grew even closer to the gang until eventually he became an official Mansfield Crip. Now, Javaris may have been making waves on the streets, but his basketball career was a completely different story. Because after joining the gang, Javaris was never able to gain his footing in the NBA. He went from the Lakers to the Grizzlies to the Wizards, all in just his first two seasons. And in December of 2009, his struggling basketball career went completely off the deep end. During a team flight to Washington, Javaris decided to pass the time by gambling on card games with his teammates. And after losing thousands of dollars, Javaris was pissed. So in the heat of the moment, he ended up getting into a fight with his teammate, Gilbert Arenas, threatening to rob the guy. Javaris is in her gangster was shown, and he wanted to settle the beef like a real Mansfield Crip. So a couple of days later, Javaris pulled up to the Wizards Arena and walked into the team's locker room with a loaded weapon. And after a heated exchange, Javaris found himself in a Wild West standoff with Gilbert Arenas. Now luckily, both guys eventually calmed down and no one ended up hurt. But that didn't stop the incident from being reported to the police. So a few weeks later, Javaris was charged with misdemeanor possession of a firearm and was sentenced to one year of probation. And following a sentencing, Javaris's contract with the Wizards was terminated. After just two and a half years, 22 year old Javaris was officially out of the NBA. This seemed like rock bottom, but in reality, it was just the tip of the iceberg. See, getting kicked out of the NBA left Javaris devastated. So he decided to fly back to Atlanta, looking for the support of his family. But what he got instead was judgment and rejection. The people that once saw him as a hometown hero now saw him as a failure. And as a result, Javaris turned to the only people that he felt would accept him, the Mansfield Gangster Crips. And by spring of 2010, Javaris had become a ride or die member of the gang, going as far as helping the Crips duck police and even put money in their jail accounts. But eventually, all of his boys got locked up. So when no one else to turn to and nowhere else to go, Javaris decided to make a last ditch effort at an NBA comeback, trying out for the Charlotte Bobcats only to fall flat on his face. By 2011, Javaris felt alone and hopeless. At just 23 years old, 
he had no job, was rejected by his family, and his closest friends were dead or in prison. Feeling like he had nothing else to lose, Javaris became a ticking time bomb, ready to explode at any moment. All he needed was a little push over the edge. And that push came on a dark Atlanta night, when, after leaving a local barber shop, Javaris was robbed of everything he had on him. His $25,000 black diamond necklace, his $30,000 black diamond watch. I mean, he even got robbed for his iPhone and 25 bucks. All by a rival gang member that Javaris recognized. 17-year-old ROC crew member, Lil Tick. And after everything Javaris had been through, this was the final straw. He wanted to find Lil Tick and get revenge. On August 19th, 2011, at 9.30 p.m., Javaris was in the backseat of a rented Chevy Tahoe, with his cousin Scooter up front, driving him to Lil Tick's last known location, Glen Rose Heights, just outside of Atlanta. And as he turned on to Macon Drive, Javaris spotted this target on the sidewalk and opened fire. But instead of hitting Lil Tick, Javaris missed and accidentally hit an innocent woman. So with this, Panic Javaris Crittenton fled the scene, as witnesses called the cops. After medics arrived, the woman was rushed to Grady Memorial Hospital, where just two hours later, at 11.34 p.m., she was pronounced dead, making Javaris Crittenton a stone-cold killer. Atlanta now on emergency upgrade 44. And the police to make them drive, and they wanted to drive by. And you said you know who did the shooting? Uh, yeah, the basketball player. C-R-I-T-T-E-N-T-O-N. Just a few days after the murder, Javaris fled to LA as police began their investigation. And over the next week, they gathered tons of evidence linking Javaris to the crime. Witness statements, his photo being picked out of a police lineup, and the discovery of the rented Chevy Tahoe coated with residue and Javaris' fingerprints. So police obtained an arrest warrant, and a couple of days later, the FBI arrested Javaris in LA, but it wouldn't be until April of 2015 that his day in court would finally come. By this point, there was so much evidence against Javaris that a life sentence seemed inevitable. So on the very first day of his murder trial, he struck a deal with prosecutors. In exchange for dropping several charges, Javaris pled guilty to aggravated assault with a firearm and voluntary manslaughter. And as a result, he was sentenced to 23 years in federal prison. So, as of this recording, Javaris is being held at Calhoun State Prison in Georgia, where, pending good behavior, he has an expected release date of December 13th, 2036. Bail reform is working. Tell Albany to stop the scare tactics and focus on real solutions to keep us safe. How do you go from $40 million NBA deals, an entire city chanting your name? Good looking, Howard's gonna let it fly, and I'll count if it goes. Oh, he put it in from three quarters court. To it all crashing down with one viral video. This is the rise and fall of Josh Howard. Josh Howard was driving his black Lexus at 94 miles an hour. Josh Howard at one time had Dallas in the palm of his hand. It's a problem. It's a problem. Now, if there's one thing you need to know about Josh Howard, he'll do just about anything to create controversy. Like, uh, let's just take a look at his draft. Howard came into the 2003 NBA draft as a projected top 10 pick but ended up being selected as the 29th pick by the Dallas Mavericks. Why? Well, in an interview just a few days before the draft, Howard thought it was the perfect time to admit to the world that he was a stoner. And in 2003 America, this would not slide. Teams around the NBA took this as Howard being lazy and undedicated. 
So, the man fell all the way to the bottom of the first round. Luckily, this didn't kill Howard's career, cause Mavericks owner Mark Cuban, he didn't really care. Mark figured if the guy could ball, then he could help the Mavericks win. However, Mark would soon realize that if Howard was gonna stay in the NBA, his skill wouldn't be enough. You see, off-court drama can be overlooked most of the time, but only if you've got at least one of these two things, tremendous skill on the court or a good reputation. And Howard would teach Mark that lesson the hard way. For now though, Howard's playing career got off to an amazing start, and by his third season, he already helped carry the Mavs to the 2006 NBA Finals. Unfortunately, this year was a loss, but it only motivated Howard. His only goal now was to win his first championship. So, coming into the next season, he took his game to a new level, putting up 18.9 points per game. In Dallas, they became the best team in the NBA, winning 67 games and only losing 15. This season solidified Howard in NBA history books, marking his first ever all-star appearance. Although, as fast as things went up for Howard, they came violently crashing down. See, fast forward to the 2008 playoffs, the Mavericks were facing a young Hornets team in the first round. And with the playoff experience that Dallas had, this series should have been an easy one. However, coming into the series, the Mavs had an unlucky start. They lost the first two games and immediately went into panic mode. These losses got into Howard's head and he started to overthink every shot and every movement on the court. Instead of putting up his usual 20 points a night, he was only scoring 12. 12! And remember how I said an NBA player needs two things, solid on-court skill and a good reputation off the court? Well, Howard was playing like trash, and his team was down 0-2 in the series. So at this point, he just needs to keep his name out of the headlines and get his confidence back on the court. But instead, he went on a radio show and made a mistake that would tarnish his public image, create a media firestorm for the Mavs, and mark the beginning of his downfall. Is all of this true that I am reading? So far as like players in the league have that problem? Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, I don't think there's nothing that's hidden in very players do smoke marijuana. Yeah, you don't feel that you have a problem, that you, you don't smoke any during the season, but you do smoke in the off season. Uh, how true is that? Yeah, it's true, but that has nothing to do with what I do as far as basketball, you know. When I go out there, I go out there and perform. See, when Howard first admitted that he smoked, it was just about him. But now, he brought the Mavs and the entire NBA into it. So, this permanently damaged Howard's public image and his relationship with his team. I mean, the media ran with the story that the devil's lettuce made him and the Mavs lazy and unfocused. And if that wasn't bad enough, instead of preparing for the next game, the entire Mavericks organization was stuck putting out the media frenzy that Howard started. I mean, even Mark Cuban had to get involved. And when he was asked about the punishment, he said, we won't make it public, but we'll deal with it internally and put an end to this. At this point though, this was Howard's first slip up. So the Mavs, they, they weren't really too worried. They just wrote this moment off as strike number one. I mean, they're in the middle of a huge series that needed their full attention. However, people can only give you so many chances. And Dallas would soon find out this was just the beginning of Howard's career crashing and burning. Super Sweeper traps and locks two times the dust and hair. Love it or your money back. As this series went on, the Mavs found themselves one loss away from going home. Now down three to one in the series, what do you think Howard did? Hit the gym, practice more, watch some film? Well, instead of doing any of that, he 
decided to throw himself a massive birthday party. Yeah, with the season on the line, Howard went as far as handing out flyers to his birthday party in the locker room after they lost while he was averaging 12 points a game. What? And to make the situation even worse, Howard told head coach Avery Johnson to cancel practice so that everyone could come. Yeah, one game away from going home. Pretty much everyone on the Mavs team was pissed. They saw this as Howard only caring about himself, and you'd think he'd be able to take a hint. But he went through with his birthday party anyways, and the Mavs were knocked out of the playoffs the very next game. The media blew up this story, and Mavs fans immediately jumped on the bandwagon, claiming that Howard's distractions ruined their season. And as far as Mark Cuban and the organization were concerned, this was Howard's second strike in a single week. Not only did Howard's antics cost them the playoffs, he was also playing like garbage. At this point, what use was it keeping him on the team? And just when you think it couldn't get any worse, Howard got arrested. When Howard went back to his hometown for the summer, he decided that getting in trouble with the media wasn't enough. Now, it's time to mess with the police. Wanda, I'm standing right by the intersection of Business 40 and Silas Creek Parkway in Winston-Salem. That's where at 11.25 last night, police say Josh Howard was driving his black Lexus at 94 miles an hour while racing another car. Howard was arrested and charged on three counts, speeding, drag racing, and reckless driving. This man was going 94 and a 55. What the hell was he thinking? When this news broke, Fans wanted Howard's head. They demanded that he be fined by the NBA or suspended for 20 games of the next season. I, it's one thing to make your team lose a playoff series. It's another thing to risk innocent people's lives. I mean, this really should have been strike three. But before the Mavericks could even react to how dangerous, stupid, and illegal this all was, that fateful straw that broke the camel's back came to light. A video of Howard went viral, and he accidentally sparked a worldwide controversy. How big a deal is this? The climate that America's in right now to come off as being unpatriotic is not good on the back of all the things that have been going on with Josh Howard for the last five months. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. And the really sad thing about it is that Josh Howard at one time had Dallas in the palm of his hand. He was an underrated player coming into this league. He proved himself to be one of the most important parts of the team. And uh, with these incidents the last few months, his whole persona there, I think, has, uh, has been turned uh, upside down. And I would be surprised if in a city like Dallas, where the red, white, and blue is so strong, right. that he survived staying on that team this year. You really think this could be fatal to his remaining in the city? I do think that. And it's not just the Dallas Mavericks, it's just any other team. This is the type of baggage you don't want to have on you because it goes beyond the Dallas Mavericks. Which team wants to pick up somebody that is being, you know, labeled as unpatriotic? So it's not just Dallas' situation, it's anybody. If Mark Cuban decides to let him go, what other team is going to pick well, him up? What, what about At this point, in just three months, Howard completely ruined his reputation. And this viral video was his third strike. The Mavs organization had enough, so they traded him as soon as they could. He bounced around three different teams, tore his ACL twice, and went from putting up 20 points a game to just six. Remember how I said an NBA player needs two things? They need some ball skill and a good reputation. Well, now Howard had neither. So shortly after, Josh Howard was officially out of the NBA. Perhaps the saddest part of the story is that just a year after Josh was traded, the Mavs went on to win the 2011 championship. Without him, the man sat on the sidelines of another team, missing out on all of the glory that could have been his. Now, 
even though Howard made a lot of mistakes throughout his career. Since his retirement, he's tried to right his wrongs. He's now a coach at the University of North Texas, helping kids be the best basketball player they can be, and teaching them all the life lessons that he had to learn the hard way. From an NBA star to a college head coach, one viral video may have been the downfall of Howard's NBA career, but it opened a new chapter, one where he can inspire the future and continue doing what he loves, basketball. No flip, no cap, no mess. Just grab and squeeze. Try Dawn Easy Squeeze. How do you go from hitting game-winning shots next to LeBron James? making over $16 million to a homeless man on the side of the street. I'm not the leader, all the games. This is Delonte West's story. Delonte had one of the toughest childhoods in the NBA. He grew up in poverty, parents divorced, the kids would constantly bully him for having red hair, making him feel like an outcast. And for years, he struggled to fit in. The only thing Delonte had was basketball. That's what gave him his ego, his identity. And as a kid, it was the only thing that made him happy. But when Delonte turned 12, he suffered his first devastating injury and it left him sidelined for months. This was the first time he wasn't able to drown out his thoughts with basketball and he spiraled into a deep depression. His mom saw he was struggling and decided it'd be best for him to live with his dad for a bit. But this only made things worse. His dad couldn't care less about what he was going through, and his new school was full of kids that were bad influences, opening the door for him to start experimenting with prescription drugs and alcohol. It wouldn't be until his leg injury healed that Delante could feel somewhat normal again, back to distracting his mind with basketball. And by the time he got to high school, he ended up turning into a star athlete, averaging over 20 points a game. It was obvious this kid had all the talent to make it to the NBA. Then in college, he took things to another level. During his junior year, Delonte and Jameer Nelson, a future NBA player as well, were known as the best backcourt in basketball, and they torched through the regular season. Delonte was averaging 19 points a game, and the two stars led the St. Joseph Hawks to a 30-2 record. This officially put Delonte West's name on the map. With the 24th pick in the 2004 draft, it became official. The Boston Celtics selected Delonte West and he accomplished his childhood dream. But as quick as things went up for Delonte, they began crumbling down. Injuries derailed his first few years in the NBA, and it wouldn't be until a trade in 2008 that the world would really get to know him, for good and bad. Delonte was traded to the Cleveland Cavaliers, giving him the opportunity of a lifetime, playing with LeBron James as the Cavs' starting point guard. This was the moment he was waiting for, but his years with the Cavs would also be filled with controversy. It started with him lashing out at teammates during the preseason, which made the Cavs force Delonte to take a break and talk with a doctor. And he ended up being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. This meant Delonte would have extreme emotional highs and lows. So he started taking medication, talking to professionals, and learning to live with this. But that was just the beginning of his troubles. Behind the scenes, Delonte had a secret life that no one knew about. In September 2009, he was arrested while riding through DC on his motorcycle. He was pulled over and had three different guns on him. And with that, Delonte's name was in headlines everywhere. And people started questioning what was going on in his life. He ended up getting a slap on the wrist, sentenced to eight months of house arrest, two months of probation, and 40 hours of community service. Then the following season, Delonte was involved in a controversy that not only left a stain on his legacy, but also LeBron's. The Cavs went into the 2009-2010 playoffs with the best record in the NBA and LeBron was on a mission to get his first ring. But after going up 2-1 in the semifinals against the Celtics, the Cavs lost three straight games and were knocked out. LeBron went from an MVP player to disengaged. And sports shows immediately jumped on the story of LeBron's meltdown, trying to figure out what happened. And they uncovered something no one saw coming. Delonte West 
was sleeping with LeBron's mom, allegedly. Rumor has it, LeBron found out that Delonte was hooking up with his mom during the Boston playoff series, and it completely threw him off his game. And just like that, the two players became the biggest sports topic in the world. Then, to make matters worse, the Cavs decided to trade Delonte away to the Timberwolves, and they waived him immediately. He then went on to sign a one-year deal for the 2010-2011 season with the Celtics, but he had the worst year of his career, so they dropped him faster than they got him. It seemed like everything was falling apart, but luckily, one more team was willing to give him a chance. The Dallas Mavericks. They saw some value in the years of experience he had playing alongside LeBron James. So, the Mavs signed Delonte to a one-year deal for the 2011-2012 season. But, this season was one of the most controversial in NBA history, and it put Delonte in a position he hadn't been in since his middle school days. The NBA officially went into a lockout during the 2011 offseason due to players and owners not being able to reach an agreement with the players union. This meant no teams could sign or trade players, players weren't allowed to use team facilities, and no one was being paid. For the first time in Delonte's career, he wasn't getting a consistent paycheck, and it turned out he hadn't been handling his money well at all. Delonte and his family had a million dollar eight bedroom mansion in DC and he could barely afford that when he was getting paid. During the lockout, a water heater broke, and the family had to heat water up on a stovetop just to take a bath. The situation got so bad that Delonte, while being an NBA player, had to go get a job at Home Depot. Yeah, this guy literally worked at Home Depot during the lockout. He was disgusted with himself, and he wanted to get rid of anything that made him feel like a failure. So Delante started selling every single piece of memorabilia he had. It got so bad that when Delante couldn't find a buy Bail reform is working. Tell Albany to stop the scare tactics and focus on real solutions to keep us safe. Higher, he would just throw the memorabilia away, just trying to erase all the pain he was going through. This lockout was one of the most difficult times in Delante's life. But luckily, it was short-lived. And by January 2012, the NBA was back in session, and Delonte still had an opportunity with the Mavericks. After hitting rock bottom, Delonte was given one last chance to turn things around. The only question now was, can Delonte actually bounce back? Even with everything going on personally, Delonte proved he could still be a solid role player in the NBA, bringing his numbers back up to nearly 10 points a game throughout the 2011-2012 season. But Delonte was still struggling personally. His criminal record kept him from getting a place in Dallas, so he was forced to sleep in his car and even the Dallas locker room. Luckily, he was working for a guy who seems to genuinely care about his people, Mark Cuban. And as soon as Mark heard about Delonte's situation, he went and got him a place approved. Delonte seemed like he had a great setup here in Dallas, but still, he couldn't stay out of his own way. Going into the 2012-2013 season, Delonte signed another one-year contract with the Mavs, and he was playing hard during the preseason games, a little too hard. He started snapping at not just officials, but his teammates, and this all hit a boiling point on October 15th. After a preseason loss, Delonte went ballistic on his teammates in the locker room, and the Mavs had enough, so they suspended Delonte for conduct detrimental to the team as a warning shot. But just 10 days later, Delonte blew up on his teammates again after another preseason loss. So the Mavs had Delonte with another suspension, and just a few days later, he was waived from the team, officially marking the end of his NBA career. At the time, Delonte was renting an apartment with a balcony that overlooked the Mavericks arena. And Delonte sat up on that balcony for days, watching fans pile into the arena, crying his eyes out, thinking about what could have been. But he had to move on. For a couple of years, he played for teams out in China and Venezuela, but never found stability. In 2015, Delonte made his way back to the US, playing for the Texas Legends in the G League. But it wasn't long before he suffered a season-ending injury in April of 2015. This marked the end of Delonte's basketball days and opened the door for the darkest chapter of his life yet. Delonte West completely disappeared. No one was talking about him. No one had any idea what he was up to until these pictures went viral in 2016. 
A fan ran into Delonte at a gas station and recognized him, so he wanted a picture, but what he got was a weird experience. The fan posted these pictures with the caption, Bro had a hospital robe on like he escaped from the psych ward or something. I asked what happened, and he said life. Damn. It's clear just looking at these pictures that he wasn't on planet Earth. Nowhere close. I wouldn't call him homeless here though. It looked like he was going through a lot, and it was taking a toll on him for sure, but homeless? Not yet. After these pictures went viral, we wouldn't hear the name Delonte West for years. No one knows what he was doing. All we know is that the next time we saw him, he was in a graphic viral video being attacked in the middle of a highway. This started going viral in early 2020, and there is a part two of the aftermath showing Delonte West shirtless, handcuffed, and in a rage. I'm reading the book, goddamn Navy Seals, and the home, and the Navy. I'm what President Trump, I'm the real president. I'm about to leave all the gangs. What happened? At this point, it was more than clear. Delonte West needs help immediately. And as these videos went viral, Delonte's former college teammate Jameer Nelson posted this message online, begging for Delonte to get help and spreading awareness on how serious mental health really is. But nothing really came of this, and it wasn't long until he once again disappeared for months. The next time we saw Delonte was September 2020, and it was clear that he was at rock bottom. What does a homeless NBA player look like? Well. A heartbreaking picture started going viral, showing Delonte on the streets of Dallas with a cardboard sign begging for money. This time, when Delonte went viral, things felt different. This picture took the internet by storm, and the NBA world started rallying together to try to get Delonte some help. Anyone and everyone that ever met Delonte was posting online, begging for someone to get him help or offering it. Even LeBron wanted to fly Delonte out to LA and offered to spend whatever money it took to get him back on his feet. But no one could find him. Every minute was important. It felt like it was a matter of time before things hit a point of no return. Thankfully, there was one more person trying to hunt Delonte down. Mark Cuban. Mark saw these pictures and videos go viral throughout 2020 as well. And as soon as he saw Delonte was in Dallas, he started making every call he could to try and find him. A few days went by, and Mark was able to get a hold of Delonte. They agreed to meet at a gas station in Dallas where Mark picked him up. Not long after, Mark confirmed with reporters that he did pick him up, saying, I could just confirm that I found him and helped him. The rest is up to Delonte and his family to tell. And we didn't hear anything about Delonte for another month or so. Then, out of nowhere, Mark shared a couple of pictures and an update, saying, Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Delonte West. A long, long, long way to go, but he's taken the first steps and shared these with all of us as a thank you for the love and support. For the first time in years, Delonte looks alive and happy. And now it's being reported that Delonte has a job working for the same rehab center that he attended. From NBA player to homeless, this might be Delonte's last opportunity to save himself. Mental illness is hell. It's an internal battle that you have to live with forever. So if there's anything you take away from Delante's story or this video, it's that it's okay to ask for help. In fact, Delante getting in that car with Mark Cuban and accepting the help he needs, that's the strongest thing he's ever done. At PC Richard & Son, our four-step mattress fitting process can help you find the right mattress so your new bed fits you perfectly. Right now, buy a select Sealy mattress, get a free TV. PC Richard & Son. I saw a video of this NBA player collapse on the court, and I was shocked. I mean, who wouldn't be? An NBA all-star, only 27 years old, and this all happened just three months before his tragic death. So what went wrong? Well, meet Reggie Lewis, the NBA player who lost his life on the court. The story of how Reggie ended up lifeless on that court started at a young age. If it wasn't for his family, Reggie wouldn't have made it to the NBA in the first place. He grew up in the rough streets of Baltimore, a murder capital of the United States, in a single parent home with his mama Peggy. She was the inspiration for him to make a way out, but not for the right reasons. 
Peggy was battling devastating addictions, and Reggie would catch her at home, getting high. This was a lot to deal with, but it motivated Reggie. He knew it was on his shoulders to find a way out. Thankfully, he found his life's passion in the only thing a kid could do in the projects of Baltimore, basketball. Reggie fell in love and dedicated his life to the game, making a name for himself as a kid, playing on local AAU teams. But when he made it to high school, his dreams were crushed. One of the most iconic true stories of all time is one about Michael Jordan and how he wasn't good enough to make it on his high school basketball team. The greatest athlete of all time couldn't make it on a high school roster. And Reggie Lewis, the man that would go on to shut down Michael Jordan in the NBA, was also cut from his first high school team. This was devastating for the kid, and he could have given up right then and there, but he stayed focused on the ultimate goal, getting his family out of the projects and making it to the NBA. By the time Reggie was in his junior year, he thought he was too good to play for his high school team, and he decided to try out for Baltimore's prestigious high school, Dunbar High. And it was at Dunbar that history was made. Reggie joined forces with future NBA players Muggsy Bogues, David Wingate, and Reggie Williams as the sixth man on this historic high school team. Think about that. This team had four future NBA players. The Dunbar Poets didn't lose a single game over the next two years. Even to this day, they're regarded as the greatest high school basketball team of all time. These guys were unstoppable, but even with all of this historic success, it was hard for Reggie to celebrate. Because every time he looked up into the stands, his mama Peggy was nowhere to be found. She was out somewhere else, battling her demons. And although his mother not being there is truly heartbreaking, Reggie didn't give up hope. He continued to use her as motivation to change their lives. Following high school, Reggie had officially made a name for himself, and he had a full ride scholarship to play over at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. And Reggie came in with a chip on his shoulder. He didn't get the same credit the other Dunbar boys got because he was coming off the bench there. So now that he's at Northeastern, Reggie has a chance to play in the starting lineup. He knew this was the biggest moment of his life. This was his last chance to prove that he belonged in the NBA. Reggie came into college on fire, carrying Northeastern to the NCAA tournament in his first year. By his sophomore season, it was clear that this dude was an NBA star in the making. His sophomore year would also be the same year that Reggie met his second half, the woman who would eventually become his wife, Donna Harris. Donna played a pivotal role in Reggie's life, serving as his backbone and becoming a new source of motivation. Reggie absolutely loved this woman, but the other woman in his life, his mama, Peggy, she couldn't stand Donna, and Donna couldn't stand her. From the very beginning, Peggy felt like Donna was there as an opportunist, trying to ride the wave of a future NBA player, while Donna was trying to convince Reggie to cut his mom off altogether, saying, once an addict, always an addict. She was worried that his mom would try to take advantage of him as he found success, and this became an internal battle for years to come. The two most important people in Reggie's life hated each other. But Reggie stayed focused. He spent four years total in Northeastern, scoring 2,708 points, shattering the previous record by over 600 points, and setting a record that still stands to this day. He spent his entire life up to this point pushing and fighting for a chance to change his family's destiny. Now that he's out of college, Reggie finally has that chance. It's time for the NBA Draft. Walking into an arena with thousands of other NBA hopefuls, there was only one thing that Reggie could do at this point. Take a seat, anxiously wait, and pray that his name is the one that gets called. Welcome to the 1987 NBA Draft. The 22nd pick in the 1987 NBA Draft select Reggie Lewis of Northeastern. Our man Reggie did it. But in his eyes, we all did it. 
He wasn't doing this for himself. He was doing this for his family. That's the guy Reggie was. And that feeling resonated not just with his family, but throughout his community. Reggie was known throughout Boston as he played in Northeastern. But when he was drafted to the Celtics, he transcended and became a hometown superhero. When it comes to basketball, the Celtics were looking for a miracle. Their dynasty with Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, and Robert Parrish was aging and on the way out. And just a year before Reggie's draft, the Celtics suffered from a heart-wrenching tragedy when they drafted the league's next superstar, Len Bias. And he tragically died just a few days after the draft. The entire city was crushed, and they needed a glimmer of hope. So the day Reggie Lewis was drafted, he became Boston's hero. That same day, Reggie also signed a contract for $400,000. Yeah, that's uh, probably not as much as you were expecting, but it was enough to do what Reggie always promised he would do, get his mom out of the projects. Despite their difficult relationship, Reggie still felt it was his job to take care of her. So the very first thing he bought when he got paid was a house for his mama. Change isn't just good, it's creamy and spicy. Rum Chata, have your unusual. Now with his family taken care of, Reggie could finally focus on the NBA. Actually, uh, Reggie's first year in the NBA was pretty slow. He only got to play about eight minutes a game, but it was for a good reason. The Celtics still had legendary Hall of Fame players on their team, like Larry Bird and Kevin McHale. Those guys were aging, but they're still all-time greats. So the Celtics decided it'd be better to have Reggie come off the bench his rookie season, play eight or so minutes a game, and soak up every bit of greatness he could from the legends while they were still around. And that's exactly what Reggie did. And by Reggie's second season, he got his first chance to shine. Larry Bird went down with an injury. It was up to Reggie to take everything he learned and put this team on his back. From this moment on, Reggie was no longer a sixth man or a bench player. He was a starter and he was becoming a star in the league. And he secured a spot in NBA history on March 31st, 1991, when he played the most iconic game of his career against Michael Jordan. Reggie Lewis blocked the greatest basketball player in NBA history four different times. What? If there wasn't a video of this dude, I wouldn't believe it. Seriously. Reggie Lewis is the only player in NBA history that Michael Jordan couldn't figure out. This is what Michael Jordan said. His length confused me. Every time I thought I had him beat, he'd recover and get up on me. He was a tough matchup. He shocked me. This night proved Reggie's greatness, and it set the stage for what would be an epic rivalry throughout the 90s. Celtics versus Bulls. Reggie versus Jordan. Right before our eyes, Reggie Lewis was taking the league by storm, becoming an all-star signing multi-million dollar contracts. His life and his family's life was forever changed. But when the money really starts coming in, so does every single family member. Every other day, Reggie started getting calls from a new family member. And the hardest call to answer was always from his mama, Peggy. She called one night begging for help. Her utilities had been turned off and she needed $2,000 to get back on her feet. At the time, she was working on her own, making $11 an hour at a paper cup factory, but all of her money was going to drugs. And you know Reggie, he gave in, and he gave her the $2,000. This was the last straw for Reggie's fiance, Donna. They were planning on getting married in just a couple of months, and she had enough of Reggie's family taking advantage of him. So she put her foot down and cut everyone off. I mean everyone. They got married just a couple of months later, in July of 1991, and had only two guests at their wedding, not a single family member. They'd have their first kid, Reggie Jr., about a year after getting married, and over time, Reggie's mother, Peggy, reached out for help again. But this time, she wanted to go to rehab. And of course, Reggie couldn't say no. He convinced Donna that they should help her, and they offered to pay the bill to get his mama some help. While Reggie was dealing with all of these personal issues, getting married, starting a family, he was still taking over the NBA. The 1991-92 season was Reggie's greatest yet. He was named an NBA All-Star, 
and the entire world recognized him as the man that was taking the torch from Larry Bird and carrying the Celtics dynasty. He was proven to be an all-time great on the court and a hero in his community. Somehow, Reggie was still making time for the people of Boston. Neighbors said he was a down-to-earth guy. You could talk to him while he was walking his son's stroller around. He'd hold open practices for kids to come play and shoot with them. He teamed up with Reebok and refurbished an entire court with new blacktop and new baskets. He'd give out turkeys on Thanksgiving, go to local schools and talk to the kids, all while balancing his wife, child, career, family issues. Reggie used his wealth and influence to not only change his family's life, but the entire community of Boston. Reggie did so much off the court, but you can't forget about what he was doing on the court. Coming off an all-star year, Reggie led the Celtics to the 1992-93 playoffs, and this was the first season without Larry Bird, as he'd just retired. This was a defining year for Reggie, and coming into the playoffs, hype was at an all-time high. The energy in the arena was electrifying. It was game one against the Charlotte Hornets, second quarter, and Reggie was jogging up the court, when all of a sudden, Reggie just collapsed on the court. He got up looking dazed and confused. Was he dehydrated? Did he have the flu? The Celtics weren't sure, so they took him out of the game, let him rest for a few minutes, and then sent him right back in. And Reggie went off, scoring 17 points in 13 minutes. But he still felt dizzy, so the Celtics pulled him back out of the game and sent him to the hospital to just get checked out. And that's where Reggie went through six rounds of testing and got the results back that night. With the six different tests that were ran, four detected a deadly defect on the bottom of his heart. News that ran chills up Reggie's spine and stunned him. Laying in the hospital, thinking about his life, everything that he worked so hard for, this came out of nowhere. And Reggie wasn't convinced it was true. So advisors put together an 11-man dream team of the top cardiologists in the area to try to get to the bottom of this. And within hours, the dream team all agreed on one diagnosis. Reggie was suffering from focal cardiomyopathy, a life-threatening damage to the heart muscle wall at the bottom of his heart. And just like that, Reggie felt his soul leave his body. As doctors told him, your basketball career is over. With over 200 flavor notes, every sip of Woodford Reserve bourbon is a spectacle for the senses. This was news that Reggie just couldn't accept. After everything he's been through, it can't end like this. So his wife Donna arranged for him to be transferred from New England Baptist to Brigham and Women's Hospital, where he could get a second opinion. Some doctors diagnosed Reggie with a neurological feigning condition and said he could return to the NBA at some point if he was on medication. This made Reggie happy, but it was still difficult to just go out there and play. He had so many other doctors telling him a completely different thing. Reggie had a wife, a 10-month-old son, and family depending on him. He couldn't just give up. And to make matters worse, Reggie's mother, Peggy, was facing her own medical problem, a blockage of a major artery. With her health insurance running out, she needed money to make three $188 payments. So Peggy brought it up to Reggie while he was in the hospital, and he agreed to make the payments. But after a conversation with his wife, Reggie called back to say that she'd have to wait, crushing his mother and permanently damaging the relationship between Donna and Peggy. After a dream team of doctors and a second opinion, Reggie decided to go to Los Angeles and get a third round of testing. A four-man team went through the process, coming to the conclusion that he did have a fainting condition, but three of these four doctors also agreed that he had a heart defect as well and needed to be monitored before any physical activity or basketball return. What do you do if a bunch of doctors say you could die if you step on the court again? But some say you'll be okay. Do you take the safe approach and retire? Give up your dream, your career, the future of your family? Reggie's life was defined by basketball. Him and everyone around him depended on it. And it wasn't long until he was spotted lightly working out, running on treadmills and weight training. Weeks went by, and the time finally came to give basketball a shot once again. Reggie decided to meet up with a few college buddies for some pickup games. And he wasn't reckless at all. By NBA standards, he was taking training easy. But within just five minutes, Reggie started to feel out of breath. He hadn't broken a sweat yet as he crumpled to the floor, gasping for air. Reggie was under cardiac arrest, pale and lifeless on the court, while people at the gym rushed around trying to get in contact with paramedics, police officers, anyone who could rush to the scene and revive him. 
He was eventually taken to Waltham Weston Hospital, where doctors rushed to save him. Jimmy Myers, a local sports radio host, was friends with Reggie and his wife Donna. And being in the radio industry, he got the news about Reggie's collapse instantly. As soon as he heard what happened, he scrambled to call Donna. Jimmy was frantic. When she picked up the phone, he told her he had something really important to tell her. But Donna cut him off first and yelled, Not until I tell you something. I'm going to be a mommy again. Donna was... Donna was pregnant again. She had just found out right before getting this phone call. Myers swallowed hard and said, Donna, you've got to brace yourself. Then broke the news of what just happened. After two hours of doctors doing everything they could, they gave in. And Reggie was pronounced dead at the age of 27. Following Reggie's death, there was constant speculation and legal issues. Reggie's will left everything to his wife, including over $10 million in contracts to be paid by the Boston Celtics. Reggie's mom and family was hurt by this. Things got so bad that fights broke out on the way to the funeral. Lawsuits were filed over doctors giving the wrong opinion, and the community in Boston was deeply hurt. Media showcased his funeral live, and there was an estimated 15,000 fans throughout Northeastern University, Reggie's college home court, where his body lay. 7,000 people attended the service, and thousands more lined the 4.7 mile path that Reggie's funeral followed to the cemetery. All because Reggie Lewis was so much bigger than basketball. The biggest question everyone had was, why did Reggie try to play basketball again so soon? Why didn't he just take it slow and safe? The answer to that question is the same thing that motivated him from the beginning, his family. He did all of this for his family. So when it came down to, do I risk my life to keep taking care of my family? Reggie said yes. He took that risk. And ultimately, his sudden death became the NBA's greatest tragedy. And one that people still feel to this very day. Dawn Power Wash Dish Spray. Spray, wipe, rinse. Dawn Power Wash. Why do NBA players fear this man? Standing at five foot three, Tyrone Muggsy Bogues is the most feared man in basketball. Do you realize how short five foot three is? Here's Muggsy next to The Rock. Here's Muggsy next to Kylie Jenner. It doesn't matter who you put Muggsy next to, he looks ridiculous. So why does this 5'3 man scare every single NBA player? How does a 5'3 man even make it to the NBA? What team would want a guy this short? In this video, I will answer every burning question surrounding Muggsy Bogues. Seeing his struggles and how he overcame them will change your life forever. Grab your popcorn, get your family together, because Muggsy's life is the most inspirational story you will ever hear. In order to understand how a five foot three man not only made it to the NBA, but also became the most feared man in basketball, you have to understand how his mind works. Muggsy has said in countless interviews that he owes all his success to one night. And it's time to talk about the night that made Muggsy who he is. It was already pretty late out. At this point, Muggsy should have been asleep, but he heard a window shatter across the street. As a five-year-old, he had no idea that the streets of Baltimore were deadly. This is the murder capital 
of the United States. But hey, he was a kid, and kids are curious. So Muggsy decided to sneak out across the street and see what was going on. This was a bad idea. He made his way over to this bar and grill right across from his apartment, when suddenly, Muggsy's five-year-old body was laid out across the pavement, bleeding, unconscious, and barely alive. He hadn't realized it yet, but he had just been shot with a 12-gauge shotgun. It turns out there were some kids outside fighting and someone broke a store window. When the owner, Old Man Chester, decided to go investigate, he pulled up and started blasting at the first thing he saw moving. Poor little Muggsy. He'd later wake up in the hospital, recovering from near-fatal wounds in his arms and legs. Somehow, he survived. At just five years old, Muggsy learned that life could be over in an instant. Being at the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, my mom and dad was going crazy not knowing that I was outside and then knowing that, you know, I was one of the kids laying out there with a couple buckshots all over his body it was very frightening. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that changed my mindset. You know, I remember early on when I used to go down on the court with my basketball and hearing all the words and hearing all the, you know, the criticism about me being short. But after I got shot, I remember going back down there and hearing those same criticism about myself, but it didn't have the same impact. Getting shot as a five-year-old and surviving gave Muggsy a cutthroat mentality. He realized then that in life, it was kill or be killed. And Muggsy decided he wasn't going to be the one that dies. So, now you know Muggsy's got shotgun shells in his butt. And you know what motivates him. Coming out of the hospital, Muggsy was more determined than ever to make something of his life. Yeah, this kid at five years old was focused on his future. Man, I was just trying to eat cereal and watch cartoons when I was five. Muggsy might have a cutthroat mentality now, but kids still saw him as a joke, and no one was afraid of him, at least not yet. It was time for Muggsy to put this new mentality to the test. With his mind focused on greatness, Muggsy started going to a nearby rec center where he would play every day for years. He was staying at the rec center playing until they closed, and when he went home, he would stay up all night playing on hoops he made for himself out of milk crates. Muggsy was already dedicating his entire life to the game of basketball, and he wasn't even 10 years old. By the time he made it to high school, he hit his max height, five foot three. He knew being five foot three is the biggest weakness anyone could ever have in basketball, but he decided he was gonna make his height something to be feared. Muggsy played one game for his local public high school team and was instantly picked up by Dunbar High. And Dunbar High is much more than any old high school. This is a prestigious, nationally recognized school known for producing athletes that go to the NBA. So with that, a lot of people question Dunbar's choice, wondering why would they want to pick up a five foot three guy? Muggsy has spent his entire life up to this point proving kids wrong down at the rec center. Now, he's got to prove himself with the world watching. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, coming in, coming in yeah, man. flex. I just wanna win, yeah. LA BB, who we running with, yeah. 2233, I'm on 10 again. Yeah, Muggsy did pretty damn good in high school. With two undefeated seasons, a state championship, and an MVP, Muggsy outplayed everyone at 5'3 his entire high school career. His success didn't even make sense. And you'd think with this kind of success going into college, Muggsy would have every option in the world. But following his high school career, Muggsy's entire world came crashing down. There wasn't one college that wanted a five foot three Muggsy Bogues. Since getting shot, Muggsy dedicated his entire life to the game of basketball and not having a single offer hurt more than getting shot ever could. He started reaching out to every school he could think of, begging for any opportunity to try out and show what he was made of. And in the end, Muggsy only heard back from one school, Wake Forest in North Carolina. Now, Wake Forest is not a prestigious school by any means, but it brought some NBA scouts around and could lead to an opportunity, if Muggsy can prove himself again. When Muggsy first stepped foot in Wake Forest, other players trying out thought he was someone's younger brother. He knew if he wanted to make it, 
he had to put the fear of God into every soul in that stadium. Muggsy laced up and started going to work. And he must have impressed whoever was there watching because that day, Muggsy earned himself a full ride scholarship and a spot on their team. Even though he made it to Wake Forest, that doesn't mean everyone wanted him there. His teammates were pretty upset that their school would bring on a five foot three guy. They had no respect for him and didn't think he belonged on the team. And it seems like the coaches felt the same way. They barely gave Muggsy any playing time his freshman year, but when he did get an opportunity, he ran with it. Over time, his teammates realized they were wrong. No need to pre-rinse. Cascade Platinum has scrubbing and rinsing built right in. Just scrape, load, and you're done. They love playing with this guy. He could set them up for greatness every night. His coaches realized they were wrong too, but Muggsy was on the floor. Their team was winning more games. By his senior year, Muggsy was averaging 14 points, nine assists, and nearly three steals a game. For a guy his height to do this, Muggsy was quickly becoming something that people had to see to believe. With Muggsy finishing his senior season, he went from not having a single school reaching out to being eligible for the NBA draft. This is what Muggsy worked so hard for. Going into the draft, analysts and talking heads all had their doubts. This guy has no shot at all. I mean, look at him. He's five foot three. What NBA team would want that guy? Luckily for Muggsy, a few days before the draft, he was invited out to a training camp in Chicago. This is a pretty typical thing. The NBA hosts training camps where teams have an opportunity to go watch guys that will be in the draft. But this training camp was different. This was the final training camp before the draft. And this was the only one that the billionaire team owners personally went to and watched. This created a new do or die scenario for Muggsy Bogues. Right now, the talk is that Muggsy might not get drafted at all, and he knew he couldn't take those chances. So Muggsy went out there and gave it everything he had. He left his heart on the floor. And now, sitting in an arena with thousands of other players waiting to see who would have their life changed forever, it was time to see if Muggsy's lifelong work would pay off. Welcome to the 1987 NBA Draft. The San Antonio Spurs select David Robinson from Navy, Dennis Hobson of Ohio State, Scott Pippen of Central Arkansas, Kenny Smith from North Carolina, Kevin Johnson from the University of California, Olden Polonese of the University of Virginia, Horace Grant of Clemson. The Washington Bullets select Tyrone Bogues. Oh, great fun. Tyrone Bogues, who's from the Washington area, Dunbar High School, is going to be loved by the fans there. He is now the shortest player in the NBA. Our boy Muggsy did it. Coming into the NBA in 1988 as the shortest player in history, he proved every single doubter wrong. And now that he's in the NBA, there's no stopping him. So, now you may be asking yourself, okay, he's in the NBA, but why do NBA players fear this guy? I still don't get it. Well, you know what? Don't take my word for it. Instead, I think you should hear from some guys that played with and against Muggsy in the NBA. Muggsy was the smallest, fiercest player that I've ever seen. He was the smallest guy on the court, but he played like the biggest guy on the court. You know, he played with the most heart. He was a spark plug. I mean, I... <laughs> Man, he had to be one of the fastest guys in the league. That scrapper, intensity, done. His competitive spirit, I mean, bigger than everyone's. You were never gonna 
punk mode. He was a pest defensively, and he bothered people. There were so many players in the league that hated bringing the ball up the court. Nobody wanted to bring the ball up against Muggsy. Very difficult to play against him. Uh, when bigger guards post him up, his teammates would say, Muggsy, you need any help? He said, nope. He's just as unaccustomed to doing this as I am. Every time Muggsy walked up to a door, he had it slammed in his face. But instead of walking away, he kicked every door down. By the end of his run in 2001, Muggsy's career made it obvious that he was more than the shortest player in the NBA. Tyrone Muggsy Bogues deserves to go down in history as an NBA Hall of Famer. Forever changing the game of basketball, this is the most feared man to ever step on the court. Doing what no one thought could be possible, if you ever for a second doubted yourself and what you could do, take a look at this man's life and think again. This is Manu Bowl one of Africa's greatest prodigies and the tallest player the NBA has ever seen. Standing at seven foot seven, I honestly don't think you guys can fathom how tall this man looks in person. You could take the rock, add a foot, and Manute would still be taller. But just looking at this guy got me thinking, is it even a good thing to be this tall? And on top of that, the main thing I'm wondering is, how the hell did this guy make it from Africa to the NBA? Well, coming from Sudan, Africa, there aren't many opportunities to make a living. It's not like there's a Taco Bell down the street where Manute can work the drive through The only option Manute had was joining their military. So that's what he did. While he was stationed, they had a basketball court nearby, and this was the first time in his life that he had a convenient court. The closest court he had growing up was 50 miles away from his village. Manute would literally walk for days whenever he wanted to go play. Man, I get when they walking in the mall. I don't know how this guy did it. Luckily for Manute, a lot of countries have some type of national basketball league that competes against other countries. And as for Sudan, that team was in their military. So when this seven foot seven dude walked in, they saw him and just handed him a basketball. This was Manute's big opportunity. Traveling around Africa with an AK strap to his back, Manute was out there repping Sudan's national basketball team. And while he was dunking on some five foot German dudes, there was an American coach on the sidelines taking it all in. Don Feely. Now Don had recently gotten fired from his job as a college head coach and he heard about this spot out in Africa that apparently had the tallest people in the entire world. And when he laid eyes on the near eight foot giant Manute Bow, it was love at first sight. At this point in time, Manute Bow couldn't speak English. Read English? Hell, he didn't even know how old he was. So I have no idea how Don managed to communicate with Manute in the first place. But he convinced him that just on height alone, Manute could easily make it into the NBA. And with that, Manute took a flight out to Cleveland, Ohio. Now that Manute's managed to make it across the world, it's time for the real challenges to begin. Now, he's got to make it to the NBA. The transition wasn't as easy as Don made it out to be. Our boy Manute ended up running into all sorts of issues throughout the next few years, like his passport saying he was five foot two. Yeah, that actually happened. When this seven foot seven dude was getting his passport set up, they measured his height while he was sitting down. Look, I'm not the passport police, but someone needs to be fired for that. On top of that, our boy Manute ended up making it to America too late to go straight to the NBA, so he was forced to play a year of college ball. This might have been a blessing in disguise though, as he was able to take an English program for foreign students, so he could actually talk to his coaches and teammates. And Manute was able to prove his worth here. He took an irrelevant college team you've never heard of, the Purple Knights, from having a couple hundred people watch their games, to having their gym sold out with thousands piling inside to see what this seven foot seven spider could do. Ultimately, Don was right. After three years of dealing with all these random BS problems, Manu did it. Coming into the league in 1985, setting a record as the tallest player in the history of the NBA, it was time for Manu 